This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's edition, we're going to deal with looking at current events and understanding what's really going on behind the scenes, behind the drama, the hype, the illusion, through the lens of Bible prophecy. It will be an up-to-date analysis of exactly where America is going and where the world is going prophetically. And it's important for you to understand the signs of the times. Jesus Christ talked about the signs of the times in the book of Matthew, and he spoke in somewhat general terms, but throughout the prophetic scriptures, uh, prophets, apostles, the Lord Jesus Christ himself gave us a more uh, focused, close-up look at prophetic events. Now, the first issue I want to address, which is one that I've been dealing with and writing about for four decades. Um, in fact, when I first began writing and researching and speaking uh, at conferences or meetings on this topic, uh, people kind of, um, you know, they, they were somewhat uh, nervous because they didn't understand uh, how things like globalism, uh, things like the European Union, things like trade treaties, um, and a global economic system, and economics itself, had anything to do with real Bible prophecy. In other words, there were many people, and, they, and these are excellent prophecy teachers, by the way, there were many people teaching on, for example, uh, the rapture of the church, is there a rapture, and from various positions, you know, pre-trib, uh, mid-trib, post-trib, etc. Uh, many people were teaching on the role of Israel in Bible prophecy, which is critical. And many people were teaching on uh, the signs of the times, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, Wars, rumors of wars, and Christ continued with uh, numerous bullet points that point to the fact that we are now in the time period called the end of the age. Obviously, the age has not ended yet, or we wouldn't even be talking together right now. We'd be in, for those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, for those of us that uh, are truly born again by the Spirit of God, we would not be here if the end of the age had concluded. Because the Bible teaches that at a certain point in the prophetic timetable, the church um, goes to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and all those who have trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, and who are born again, they will enter the kingdom of heaven, where they will live eternally in paradise with glorified brand new bodies at the perfect age, totally healthy, happy, joyous. We'll celebrate with the Lord Jesus Christ um, the birth of heaven and the new earth, the new heaven and the new Jerusalem forever and ever and ever in a place, a wonderful place called eternity. Now, I deliberately didn't talk about a specific time frame regarding the rapture, not that I don't have an opinion. I certainly have an opinion. I've, I've taught on that subject at, uh, as a professor of uh, eschatology at a major uh, Christian university and seminary. So I'm very well versed in all the different perspectives regarding whether or not there is a rapture, whether the rapture and the, se uh, the second coming are uh, the same event, or whether there is a pre-trib rapture, uh, mid-term pre-wrath rapture, post-trib rapture, and many other uh, methods of uh, interpreting the scripture. But the point is that <clears throat> at the point that God decrees that it will happen, um, the church 
and all those who are true believers in Jesus Christ <clears throat> will be in heaven with God eternally. And that's something to look forward to. That's why the Bible's called the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, um, it is amazing to me. This is kind of a side note to where we're, we're gonna, what territory we're going to get into. But it is amazing to me. There was a time in my life when I wasn't born again. I was raised an atheist. And I remember sitting on my mom's lap when I was a little boy. I don't know. Nursery school. Yeah, probably nurse, nursery school or kindergarten or something like that. And my mother would, would regularly uh, read books to me as I sat on her lap as a little boy. And she developed the habit. Now that I think about it, she did it intentionally. Uh, it wasn't an accident, but she read books to me. And, you know, um, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when they're old or older, they will not depart from it. That means spiritual instructions. But it also means other kinds of input that we feed into a child. And isn't it interesting that, and, and the intention of me bringing this up is not to, you know, pat myself on the back. But isn't it interesting that I'm a writer of uh, books. I've written, I can't remember, 30, 31 books. Uh, I've written tons of articles, many of which you can read for free at paulmcguire.us. I've written press releases, articles, a lot of writing as a writer and an author. And consequently, as a speaker, a debater, and guess where all of that came from? It came from me sitting as a little boy on the lap of my mother who would read to me. There's something that happens to a child when he or she is young neurologically, the way the, the brain gets wired, that when you're, for example, exposed to reading words, language, literature, it, it causes your brain neurologically uh, to be able to process uh, words, language, writing, etc., understand writing, love writing, and increase your knowledge quantumly because you were exposed repetitively as a young child <clears throat> to hearing words and to discussing words and sentences and writing. So it's a, I look back, as it was a God-ordained programming in the good sense of the word that my mother embedded in me as a young child. And it's not just like an accident why... I write <clears throat> books, why I speak, and so much of my life revolves around either verbal articulation or uh, words, <clears throat> research, etc. It's not just an accident. It's not just a gift that, you know, uh, blew like a bunch of leaves on the front doorstep. No, it was a result of my mother, who was not a believer, by the way. She was an atheist, reading to me. And so the only reason I'm sharing that to you is that if you are now <clears throat> a parent or you're <clears throat> a grandparent and you have the capacity to either influence a child directly or influence a child indirectly by communicating to the parent, uh, the caretaker, the aunt, the grandmother, the great-grandmother, father, uh, whoever uh, has... Uh, close input into any child's life in the good sense of the word whatever you program that child to be and to become whatever you expose them to at that critical age <clears throat> when the brain is really forming neurologically that means it's wiring itself it's programming itself to do certain things and if it doesn't have the proper input, for example, if you don't expose the kid to, uh, the, the, to writing and reading and literature, uh, there's a high likelihood that they will never excel in that area. 
except for what the, the school system puts into them. And I've also heard that <clears throat> exposing a, a, a child to classical music uh, because of the complexity, because of the depth and the range of classical music, it, it wires the brain neuro neurologically. It increases intelligence uh, by, by a very vast rate. And so children raised who are exposed to classical music, they have far more neurological pathways. They're smarter. Their IQs are higher because of that exposure. And in the spiritual sense, when you train up a child with and by reading and exposing the child to the Word of God and Christianity and taking them to church, to a Bible-believing church, and reading the Word to them in, in a way that they can understand it, uh, <clears throat> that, that the Word stays in them. That exposure to Jesus Christ and God's word stays with them their entire life. And as such, and I'm speaking to those of you who are, who are suffering, the, the trial <clears throat> of looking at your children, and they've walked away from the Lord, they've rebelled from the Lord, and perhaps you're getting older and you're despairing. Um, remember, any input that you gave in that child's life, either when they were young, that's the, the best time, or, but even if they were teenagers or mid-teens or late teens or, or 20s or 30s, the ideal time is when they're young. But the input of God's word at any time in your child's life, it, God's word is a seed and there will be a spiritual harvest. So taking the biblical uh, for, uh, expression, train up a child when he or she is young and they will not depart from it, you, in a good sense, have programmed that child to walk with the Lord. And even though they may rebel for 10 or 20 years or longer or shorter, you have got that word in them and they will come back to it. They will eventually, if you keep praying because you've planted the seed, look at it this way, by exposing them to the word of God, you have planted the seed of the word of God in their hearts and minds. And if you keep watering that seed that you planted in their hearts and minds by praying, by continually praying, eventually they'll come back to the Lord. And that's a powerful promise to you. Think of it as exposure to the Word of God just by talking to them or whatever, giving your testimony, witnessing to them, is planting the seed. And praying is watering the seed, and eventually life will come out of that. So never despair. And it's never too late, by the way. It's, of course, it's optimum to do it when they're young, but never despair. Now, the other thing I wanted to share, we, we could go on and on about what you can expose your child to. The proper visual things, not the improper visual things, obviously. That's why it's so disturbing, by the way. <clears throat> the, the, the mainstreaming of uh, pornography or soft porn or whatever in our nation and world. It's the new norm, but the tragedy is that it is really young boys and young girls that are exposed at a very young age simply because the computer or the laptop or whatever is has become the essential tool of communication and learning um, and no matter how hard you try, there's still that risk that they, they're going to be exposed to porn. If not on your computer or their computer, I'm not saying that you have porn on your computer. I'm saying they're using a search engine. But, you know, their friend, when they go to their friend's house or the friend's uh, parent's computer or at school or whatever. And, and now they don't even need a computer. They can walk out anywhere with a, a, a cell phone and, and watch all this stuff. But the... The, the tragedy is, is that by exposing them to such very intense graphic sexual images, it rewires their brain neurologically in, in terms of sexuality at a very young age, and it distorts it. And I don't, I don't want to get off on this topic too much, but uh, 
when I was a, a young boy, and many of you when you were young women and young boys or whatever, uh, prior to basically prior to the internet, or, or pr I should say prior to VHS and Betamax, um, you know, <clears throat> even growing up in New York City, uh, when you were a young kid, you just, unless, you know, your dad had Playboy magazines or something lying around, you, you weren't exposed to that. And even if you were, it was nowhere near as intense, way out there and graphic as it is today. So you're rewiring re in a very evil way uh, negative images of sexuality that really distort the human identity. So we need to, you know, expose our children to uh, things that are good and pure and holy and decent, etc., and uh, and pray over their minds, etc. Now, the reality is though that you got nine-year-olds, eight-year-olds by the millions. 10, 12, 11, 13, 14, and so on, and even younger, being exposed to this stuff because of the older brother or somebody's computer, uh, you know, and, and it's really a tragedy. We need to pray over the minds of our children, even when they're adults, and, and for ourselves. So, um, going back to uh, my childhood, I remember when my mother was reading to me when I was a young boy, I can remember it to this day. The Holy Spirit must have kept it alive in my consciousness because there's no real reason rationally that I would remember this conversation that I had with my mom when I was like, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years old. No, it would be seven years old, around that time. My mother was reading to me, and somehow, whatever she was reading to me, there was a sentence that talked about God. And I interrupted my mom when she read the sentence about God. I must have been thinking about this as a young, young boy. Uh, I asked my mom, <clears throat> I said, Mom, do you believe in God? And is there a God? And uh, a couple of other questions that were along that line. And, and I remember it right now, even like it was yesterday. I remember so clearly. And this is, you know, phenomenal. This is a memory from when I was like seven. And I remember, you know, the, the complexities of the memory. So God must want me to remember this. So I asked my mom those questions, and I distinctly remember, uh, as a young boy, hearing the tone of her voice change. It subtly changed. And I, I sensed, even as a seven-year-old, I sensed that, she, she was processing, I didn't know what the word processing meant back then, but she was processing a question. And even though she was an atheist, she had a high degree of integrity as a humanist. I mean, she had a very strong sense of right or wrong. So I could hear her, the wheels of her mind turning for a second before she responded. And I sensed, even as a seven-year-old, that she was trying to answer me in a way that was as honest as she could be and to be fair as she could be because she somehow, and I believe it was the Spirit of God moving upon her, somehow she did not want to be morally or spiritually responsible for uh, blocking me from believing in God. Uh, that's if you knew my mother, this is kind of odd. So now that I think about it, it just came to my mind right now as I'm sharing this with you. Now that I think about it, it had to have been the Spirit of God moving upon my mother, and he was in that situation that I just described to you. And he allowed me to remember it, and she answered the question something like this. She said, Paul, um, even though she was an atheist, she kind of qualified it when she answered me. She said, Paul, you know, I I don't, uh, she said something like, I, I, a lot of people believe in God and believe that there is a God. And then you know, she might have added another sentence to it, trying not to be prejudiced. So naturally, as a young boy, my next follow-up question was, well, mom, do you believe in God? And again, there was a pause. 
slight change in the tone of her voice. And even though I had overheard her talking on other occasions, not to me, but I overheard her talking, saying that she didn't believe in God, uh, when she replied to my question, Mom, do you believe in God directly? She paused, hesitated. There was a change in the tone of her voice, and she said, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess, you know, you can call me like an agnostic. So she, see, somehow, and I believe she was responding to the Spirit of God that was moving upon her, somehow she wanted to be very careful on how she handled that because uh, no, she did not want to be responsible uh, for creating a barrier between me and God, if there was a God. So it, it was a sacred moment that I never forgot. And later on, uh, God would draw me to himself, and I got saved. I've accepted Jesus Christ. But I'm sure you can recall things like that in your life. And all of that is evidence of the fact that you and I were called before the beginning of time to be here for such a time as this, and that God knew you before the foundation of the world. And as such, because God is omniscient, he knows the uh, future, he knew that you would accept him, and he knew that I would accept him. So he, he intervened in that situation. He probably, in fact, motivated the whole situation and brought it into being by his Holy Spirit. Because, you see, that question and short dialogue with my mother, the Spirit of God seemed to, to, to move through her answer and speak to me in my heart in a way that I'm not fully aware of today. But recalling it, I sensed in my inner being back then that there was a God. And even though I didn't say it, as far as I remember, I could have, um, and, I, and I don't recall saying it out loud to her, but I could have, I recall that I believed in God. See, I didn't know who he was, et cetera, et cetera. So God does that in people's lives. And I just thought I'd share that. Now, back to prophecy. And I was talking about the end of the age, uh, the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. And um, the fact that it is God's greatest desire that every man and woman alive uh, comes to Jesus Christ and accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they put their faith in him for, for forgiveness of sins, and that they are born again by the Spirit of God, because it's God's greatest desire that every single person can be in heaven with him eternally, because God is love. Yes, God is just. Yes, God is righteous. Yes, God is holy. But he balances those characteristics because he's also love. And that's why in John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believeth upon him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so the primary reason we're alive, we're, we're alive for a lot of other reasons, but and we shouldn't minimize the importance of the other reasons. You know, even though there's a primary reason, that doesn't mean the other reasons disappear. The primary reason is we are alive to glorify God in numerous ways. And how do we glorify him? By demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ, by uh, sharing with others uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, by praying for others, by raising up our children in the way of the Lord, by uh, participating in God's end times soul harvest, because God doesn't want anybody to be separated from him eternally. So before I progress on this teaching on Bible prophecy, I would like to speak to everybody out there and 
in the event that you're listening to me talk and you uh, have never come to the place where you have <clears throat> prayed and <clears throat> asked Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins and prayed and invited Jesus Christ to come into your life and make you born again, then I want to encourage you to make that your number one priority whether you choose to do that now or later on in the program, uh, or or keep it in mind. Just don't toss it somewhere out of your brain because it's the most important question you will ever answer. It's the most important decision you will ever make while you're alive on planet Earth. Remember that. And it's not an accident why you're listening to this program and listening to my voice. The Lord has been reaching to, out to you through many means, and this is just another means the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, is reaching out to you because God loves you. That's not a trivial answer. It's not a corny answer. God loves you. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for the penalty of your sins upon a cross so that you could be forgiven by God, born again, and receive eternal life and live forever and ever with God in the most incredible, joyous place called heaven <clears throat> and live eternally. If you, if you reject God's free offer of salvation, then uh, inevitably you will pay the consequence because you will go to the great white throne of judgment and God, you will stand before a holy God and God will look, even though he already knows, to see if your name is written in the book of life. <clears throat> and how is your name written in the book of life? It's written in the book of life because you made the decision to receive Christ as your Savior and to become born again. But if you haven't done that, then you're going to stand before God at the great white throne of judgment. God, because he's fair, is going to replay uh, He'll be able to compress time. He'll replay uh, countless important events in your life regarding this question. And you will see that you were given the opportunity numerous times. And then he will pronounce judgment. But you see, because you rejected his offer to be cleansed of sin, and according to the, his own laws, the way he created the universe... If you reject forgiveness of sins, then you must, by God's eternal cosmic law, pay for the penalty of your sins or sin by yourself. And according to God's cosmic law, the penalty for sin, even one sin, just one sin, is death. Because you see, sin is a force. It's not just one act. The very fact that you can commit one sin, even one itsy-bitsy sin, uh, the fact that you can do that means that you haven't been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb when you, when you stand before God at the uh, great white throne of judgment. And so he has to, by his own law, uh, sentence you into uh, eternity in a place called hell, uh, along with Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, all those who accepted the mark of the beast. And it's a place of eternal torment. Now, we can debate all the theological things that we want to, and we don't have time at this moment, because I'm sure you have questions like, well, how can a loving God sentence people to hell? And there are numerous answers that are very logical. And if I had the time, I would explain it to you. And you would understand why. He's totally fair. I can't do it now. Uh, and then other questions like, well, why eternal torment? Why not just soul sleep or death? And there's a reason for that too, but I don't have time to explain it to you <clears throat> in a way that would satisfy you in just a couple of minutes. If you really dig into the Bible, which most people don't, I didn't before I was saved, uh, God answers these questions. And you will discover that every question you ask God, and it may take you some time to, to get enough knowledge of his word, 
uh, God will answer your questions, and you will always be satisfied with the answer. And you will always acknowledge, you know what, he's fair. There's a reason for doing this. Now, there's some things which we uh, don't understand down here on earth. But you see, after you get to know God personally, after you walk with God personally, you discover just how loving, kind, caring, and compassionate and fair God is. And so when you know God, even though you may not have an answer to everything, the fact that you know him, you know he, would do, he wouldn't do anything that was cruel or unjust or mean. And therefore, based on your relationship with him, because you know him and your faith in him, you can trust him that when you finally get to heaven, that he'll, he will be able to answer certain things that you didn't understand on earth. But that, don't, that only comes when you walk with the Lord and have a relationship with the Lord and get to know him, because he's a phenomenal God. I mean, he really is. You may have some ideas about God in your head. You may have some ideas about the Christian God that are distorted. And you may have gotten that, that distorted idea about God from Christian churches or Christians who didn't model or represent Jesus Christ very well. You know, they were cruel, condemning, legalistic, or whatever. So, I just want you to consider that as <clears throat> we move into uh, Bible prophecy and explain what's happening in this world. Because... No matter what happens in this world, the Bible says we are sojourners, which means we're just passing through this world for a limited amount of time. And then we all, every one of us, we all die. Or if we're alive, uh, when the Lord comes back, then we are taken up into heaven. But one way or another... You die or you're taken up into heaven, assuming you've put your faith in Christ. If you haven't, then you're not taken up into heaven. You're brought into the uh, great white throne of judgment. <clears throat> so all the, the purpose of Bible prophecy is not to terrify people. It's not to give a doom and gloom message. It's not to manipulate people. The purpose of Bible prophecy is that God is trying to communicate to you why you are in this current world, which is a nightmare, by the way. You can pretend it's not, but it is. It's a fallen world where tremendous evil happens every day. And God is showing you in Bible prophecy what he is doing about that problem because he's not ignoring it. God is not ignoring the children sold into sex trafficking and all the other horrors that are happening. God is showing you what his prophetic program is, which means he's telling you, what is going to happen in the last days and what is going to happen before he brings people who believe in him into eternity and creates the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. That's the purpose of prophecy. And the other purpose of prophecy is God uses prophecy to prove his existence uh, and his reality to people who are skeptical because the only spiritual book written there is no other. Okay, let's not play games and uh, say, well, these other books have prophecies that came true. No, that's not true. Not specific prophecies. They don't. You can pretend they do. They don't. Only the Bible has countless specific prophecies in the Old Testament and the New Testament where the prophets, the apostles, and Jesus Christ made specific predictions about things that were going to happen in the future, with, in minute detail. And so many of those prophecies, predicted thousands of years ago, have come true, literally and specifically, as the Bible declared. For example, in the book of Isaiah, there are all, there are all these specific prophecies about the coming of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, born from a virgin, and so many other specific details. And uh, then when Christ came, uh, he was born of a virgin. And when Christ was alive, he talked about what is coming next, the prophetic signs of the times. But, but the prophecies about the last days and the si signs of the times are all over the Old Testament. They're in the book of Genesis. 
They're in the book of Daniel, where Daniel describes the last days, the chronological time clock of the last days. This is all a, a means of God proving to you that he is real, if you're honest enough to study his word. You see, most people who criticize the Bible don't read the Bible. They just, just, just dismiss it. And that's why they'll be judged, by the way. You really need to understand this. God is fair. Think about it this way. Nobody is going to go to hell because God decided to put them there. All that people, all the people who go to hell are going to, to go there because they decided to put themselves there. You need to meditate on that, that, that expression. The people who are going to hell, they're the ones that decided they're going to spend eternity in hell. Because when God replays their lives many times at the great white throne of judgment, they will see hundreds if not thousands of opportunities God gave them to hear the gospel and to act on it by repenting of their sins and asking Jesus Christ to save them. But they chose to reject that, knowing that the consequences uh, are eternity in hell. So they and, and, and no one else can blame God that they're in hell because they chose out of their own free will to send themselves to hell. How many times have you heard the expression? I've heard it. I used to say it myself. It's a pathetic expression. I used to say it all the time. And you probably have heard it all the time. I hear it all the time. Well, I have no problem going to hell because at least all my friends will be there and we'll be able to party and do all the fun things. Ha, 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 ha. You hear it all the time. I'm not afraid of hell because I'll be there partying along with all my other friends having a good old time. So what they're doing by that is they're mocking God and they're also rejecting his opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. So they are choosing to send themselves to hell. And Bible prophecy is a means of God proving to anybody who it bothers to inquire that he is the only true God because no other book, no other spiritual book ever written contains fulfilled prophecy. And no other so-called God or Messiah or whatever, spiritual teacher, none of them, Listen carefully. None of them, without exception, died and resurrected from the dead. Not one. Not Buddha. And we can go through the list of all of the other so-called gods, prophets, spiritual teachers. And every single one of them, without exception, when they died, they stayed dead. The only person that claimed to be God who died and actually resurrected from the dead and then ascended into heaven, was Jesus Christ. That makes him completely unique and different than all the other gods or prophets or teachers. And on that basis alone, that was really the, the most convincing argument for me when I didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Of all my uh, possible religions that, that I could potentially have believed in, uh, because I was raised an atheist and was deeply involved in the New Age movement and Eastern mysticism for like 15 years as a young man, um, Christianity was like the lowest religion on my list of religions of, of what I could possibly believe in. It wasn't really at the bottom. There was one other religion uh, that was below Christianity. But Christianity was at the bottom of the list with the exception of one other religion. And that was the Hare Krishna movement, where they, you know, you see them chanting in uh, airports in these uh, orange day glow uh, pajama things, chanting Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna, and banging the tambourine. But to me, that was so, you know, I'm not trying to attack you if you believe that, but it's so idiotic and so insane uh, that that was my lowest choice. But Christianity was just one notch above it. And I hated Christianity, and I hated Christians, and I absolutely thought it was total nonsense. But when I pondered the fact that Jesus Christ was the only person who claimed to be God that actually resurrected from the dead, it was really a no-brainer. I mean, I had a lot of other questions, but that was a no-brainer. Because that was irrefutable proof that Jesus Christ was God, period. Now, 
So in prophecy, God is proving that he's God because he's telling you the end from the beginning. And then as these things, these signs of the times unfold, God is using his prophetic word to say, hey, I said that was going to happen. So when we talk about something like globalism and the, the plan of the globalist elite to create a new world order, which it's very ironic because the term new world order, uh, originally when I start, first started writing books on the new world order, etc., you know, you were considered a, a conspiracy theorist nut for talking about the new world order, despite the fact that you had all this documentation from mainstream sources that there was a new world order, you were still labeled, and the media to this day, they're, they're caught in a, the crossfire now because on one hand, they're mocking the new world order, saying it doesn't exist. But on the other hand, in, in, in the last year or two, there have been more open discussions about from world leaders and some of the most powerful people in the world who continually speak openly on television interviews, uh, radio interviews, newspaper magazine interviews. These people speak about openly the reality of the new world order. They actually admit it. George Bush Sr. admitted it briefly, and then he kind of retreated. But George Soros is constantly talking about the new world order openly, saying Trump is the greatest threat to the new world order. Well, the question is, since when has the new world order ever been good? Who, who believes that the new world order is good? The only people who believe that the new world order is good are a microscopic number of the super elite because it benefits them. The vast, overwhelming majority of people on the planet Earth think the new world order is evil. I mean, Kissinger thinks it's good. He talks about it openly, like on the television interview uh, on the New York, uh, the, the New York uh, Stock Exchange. Brzezinski talks about the new world order. Bush Jr. talks about the New World Order. Obama has talked about the New World Order. And you can go on and on. They've talked about it openly as a great thing. But the overwhelming number of regular people don't believe for a second that the New World Order is good. And in fact, when you study Bible prophecy, you see that God, and you don't hear this is in churches because churches, 74% of the evangelical churches don't teach God's prophetic word. They censor it, which is a ludicrous proposition in and of itself. And of the remaining 26% that do teach Bible prophecy, there's even a lesser percentage that teaches Bible prophecy in, in any kind of detail. So people are ignorant of the truth because they, they, they have chosen to place themselves in churches where the truth is... is uh, uh, not revealed fully, or they get a couple of droplets of the truth and, and ignore the entire body of truth contained in Scripture. So if you read in the book of Genesis, which most churches don't even teach from the book of Genesis, except, you know, they'll quote something out of context. Uh, in the book of Genesis, you read the account of ancient Babylon and Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. And that was where the world's first one world government, one world religion, and one world economic place uh, happened. And that is, by the way, the goal of the current new world order. They have said it many times. Kissinger said on the stock exchange floor on television, he just changed a couple of words, but, but he calls it the new world order by that term most of the time. This time he said the new international financial order. He was specifically talking about the one world economic system. And so in ancient Babylon, that was the first new world order. And the goal of the new world order is to establish a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world economic system, which they did in ancient Babylon before God judged them for it because the new world order, which could also be synonymous with mystery Babylon, was judged by God because the purpose in their hearts was evil. They wanted to be like God. It was a Luciferian uh, one-world government, one-world religion, and one-world economic system. So God judged them. Now, why did God uh, put that account of the first new world order and Babylon 
and the account of the one world religion, one world economic system, and one world government, why did he place it so prominently in the book of Genesis? He placed it prominently in the book of Genesis to serve as a warning to all who would read it that the basic concept, the foundational concept, as well as the implementation of ancient Babylon and the Tower of Babel, which was a one-world government, one-world economic system, and one-world religion. It was the world's first new world order. God perceived that for what it was. It was Luciferian. It was inspired by Satan. And God could see into the hearts and minds of men and women back then that they wanted to be as God. And so ultimately, the entire uh, uh, Babylonian system, ancient Babylon and the Tower of Babel, was a rebellion against God. It was evil. God labeled it as evil. So God put that in the book of Genesis to serve as a warning so that when the next new world order started to rise, which is, by the definition of the elite that are the ones promoting and financing this new world order. By their own words, the elites say that the new world order will be composed of a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world economic system. Now, immediately when you hear that, and you hear, uh, for example, the praises of the new world order continually like by George Soros and, and many others, <clears throat> you say to yourself, okay, George Soros seems to say it's a great thing. Well, um, what does the Bible say about it? And God went out of his way to deal with the subject of a new world order. And God said it was evil, it is evil, and when it arises, it will be judged by God. Judgment will come down upon the new world order, the one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system. God will judge it because it's evil. And it's also Mystery Babylon. It's the ancient Luciferian world system coming together again, the mystery Babylon system coming together again, which the Bible prophesies in numerous places, and it's talked about in Revelation 17 and 18, mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. Why is mystery Babylon the mother of harlots or whores? Because she has, she has rejected the true God, and is involved in an illicit relationship with Satan and the Luciferian system. And through, through the Babylonian system, all the demonic works of hell are able to be released. That's why God judges her, and talks about mystery Babylon, fallen, fallen. You know, your judgment has come. So any Christian should be, any Christian pastor seminary teacher or whatever, anybody who, who has read the Bible, you should know instantaneously, it's a no-brainer, you should know instantaneously once the subject is brought up about a new world order, you should know instantaneously, without missing a heartbeat, that that new world order is Luciferian in nature, satanic in nature, and that it's evil, and that God is going to judge it severely. Now, here's the problem. Because so many of uh, evangelical churches, 74%, don't teach Bible prophecy, and even among those that do teach Bible prophecy, there's an even smaller percentage that teach uh, Bible prophecy in depth. So the likelihood of you going into a, an evangelical, so-called Bible-believing church, you can fool yourself all you want, but you're not fooling God. The likelihood if you, of you hearing biblical teaching explaining to you what ancient Babylon uh, and the Tower of Babel was really all about is, is practically zero. The likelihood of you understanding uh, the relationship between the ancient Babylon and the Bible, which was judged by God as Luciferian, and God's uh, 
prophecy that Babylon in the last days will rise again, where it will also be judged. And God goes into detail about it. Uh, is practically zero if you attend the average church in America and around the world. So now you have uh, kids from Christian families, Christians by the millions in America, and it's even it's even greater in Europe um, and in on every continent. Wherever you're listening to me talk, whether you're in, in the Asian region of planet Earth, or uh, the continent of Africa, or South America, or North America, or wherever you are located in the Middle East, you, your uh, educational system has largely been influenced and controlled and developed by the super occult Luciferian elite the very people that are putting together this new world order, the new new world order, the very elite that are putting together this new world order are the same elite that are uh, uh, controlling the media uh, and the educational system and all forms of communication, etc. And, and they control to a large extent through hidden hands the content of sermons in churches and uh, courses in seminaries. So, of course, you're going to hear by design almost nothing about the what the Bible has to say about the New World Order in Babylon because the super elite, um, that's their number one agenda. That's, that's what they're all about. And they ha took control over the public education system all around the world um, beginning with uh, uh, Julian Huxley and before that. And Julian uh, Huxley, the brother of Alice Huxley, was uh, the founder of UNESCO. And we'll discuss that in a moment. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. You can get all kinds of free information, downloads of this program. You can send it to your friends by going to paulmcguire.us, paulmcguire.us. And you can, uh, as I said, go to paulmcguire.us and you'll see the banner for the Paul McGuire Report. And then on the right, you'll see a whole list of uh, uh, social media apps like YouTube and iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and Blueberry and RSS, etc. And you can send the links of this program on any app you choose. People can listen to this program anywhere in the world, on their cell phone, their laptop, however they choose to listen to it, record it, <clears throat> uh, listen to it on blog talk radio, record it, play it in their headphones when they're exercising or doing household chores or whatever they're doing. I constantly talk to people who listen to this program <clears throat> um, on their headphones uh, while they're, or, or earbuds or whatever, while they're shopping, driving, and you know, doing all kinds of stuff, jogging, so we thank God for each and every one of you out there who are listening via all these communications. And you can help uh, share the truth with people you love and people that God places uh, on your heart by sending them uh, a link of this program. And in addition to that, we have all kinds of book specials, DVD specials, uh, tons of free articles, free YouTubes. All at paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Also, we regularly post when the uh, latest Paradise Mountain Church meeting, uh, where and when it will be held. And then we will be posting soon my uh, prophecy conference speaking schedule, at least as far as we have it. So go to paulmcguire.us and uh, sign up for the um, <coughs> e-blast. And... Uh, spread the message far and wide because it's a means of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of this ministry. The central purpose of this ministry is to win people to Jesus Christ, save souls, make disciples of all nations. That means communicate and educate them to a biblical worldview. Uh, occupy the land until he comes. That's something that most Christians don't 
know anything about, but it's one of Jesus's primary mandates. And one of the primary purposes of this ministry is to teach God's people how to effectively occupy until he comes or do business until he comes or kingdom business until he comes. And, and the word says, my people are perishing because of lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of what? My people, God says, are perishing for lack of knowledge of the word of God. They're, they're perishing all around the world and in the United States. God's people unnecessarily are perishing, are facing horrific trials and tribulations, many of which uh, could be avoided had they only been exposed to strategic and good Bible teaching of the entire Word of God, which includes Bible prophecy, so they could be spiritually prepared and be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, to be overcomers in Jesus Christ, rather than to be victims. You know, I looked at um, a statistic today, and I was horrified, man. I'm, I'm telling you, I was totally horrified. I, I've known for a long time that persecution against Christians in America has <clears throat> risen dangerously. And uh, it, it doesn't take a genius to project that it's going to increase and intensify. <clears throat> Unfortunately, most Christians hearing me say that will immediately think in their heads, well, that's what God said will happen. It's a sign of the end times that uh, Christians will be persecuted. And so, you know, we should thank God for the increase of persecution in America and around the world. Now, the problem with responding that way, uh, once again, is because it is a partial truth to respond that way. In other words, that response is partially true and partially biblical. But that response is mixed with very deep and dangerous spiritual error because you're accepting a partial truth and then adapting your belief system and your behavior based on a partial truth rather than truly rightly dividing the Word of God and really taking the time to understand what the Word of God says about this. You know, the difference between uh, lazy thinking and being diligent. God continually, in his word, uh, talks about the principle of diligence. The diligent shall bear rule, and the slothful or the lazy shall be under tribute or slavery. Think about that. That just doesn't apply. That's a kingdom principle, but it doesn't just apply to God's people. That principle applies to people who hate God and people who love God. The diligent shall bear rule. They will rule over the lazy. The diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful or lazy shall be under tribute or slavery or persecuted or, or you know, suffer uh, horrible consequences and injustice. Now, let's just take that for a minute. Let's just take that verse. And I have tons of prophetic verses that I can discuss, but let's just take that verse and apply it to the increase in persecution among Christians in America. Oh, and before I forget, the statistic that I saw, which really woke me up, was, uh, according to a very respected poll, America, that's right, America is among the top 12 nations in terms of persecuting Christians. So the worst nations of planet Earth in terms of persecuting Christians. Now, one would think that many Muslim nations would be in that category, and that's true. But of the top 12 nations guilty of the most persecution against Christians, America is now in that list. America is now in the top 12 nations of persecution against Christians. 
And you've got to think for a moment what other nations are on the list. And you're probably saying, well, they're Muslim, they're totalitarian, these are evil nations. Yeah, but America, I'll bet you anything France is not on that list. I could be wrong. I'll bet you Italy is not on that list. I'll bet you Me Mexico is not on that list. But America is on the list of the top 12 nations in terms of persecution against Christians. Now, I ask you, is that a simply a sign of, of, of the last times? Is that simply Bible prophecy being fulfilled as many Christians would respond? And again, I challenge you, I exhort you to rightly divide the Word of God and just don't interpret it based on a partial, partial truth, which most Christians do. They say, oh, praise God, we're being persecuted more intensively, and that just means Jesus is back and coming back sooner. Praise God. You know what? That is lazy, irresponsible thinking. And that is not even remotely what the Bible teaches. And why do you think people think like that? Because they go to churches that, that the only spiritual diet they get is Captain Crunch or Fruit Loops. Spiritual diets of Fruit Loops and Captain Crunch with genetically modified milk. Cheers, baby. So, is that what God's word really says? No. You took a partial truth and you took it out of context. If you simply enter this truth into the equation, but, but there's multiple verses, multiple, countless verses you could add into this equation. But if you simply took the slothful or lazy shall be under tribute or slavery, and, and, and the diligent, or no, excuse me, the diligent shall bear rule, and the slothful or the lazy shall be under tribute or sla slavery. Well, who's under slavery in America when it comes to persecution? We're now in the top 12 list of nations, but we have a constitution which, for the most part, still guarantees us largely Freedom of religion, free, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Now, it's been eroded, but it's still there. So we have the constitutional right, according to the legal law of the land in the United States of America, to openly practice our Christian religion. So what's the problem? Why are we in the, the top 12 nations of persecution against Christians? Here's the problem. God gave us America as a gift we are the spiritual heirs of the pilgrims and Puritans who entered into a covenant with God in Deuteronomy 28. But we, in the body of Christ, going back 50, 60 years ago or more, have rejected God's word. We have not, not only are we not diligent in, in terms of rightly dividing the word of God and studying it, but we're not diligent in interpreting the word of God and we're not diligent in applying the word of God. Thus, we are lazy or slothful. And thus, according to God's kingdom principles, we are inevitably uh, under tribute or slavery or persecution. Not because it's a prophetic sign. Although, if you take it out of context, you could make it all about that. But specifically, it's not about that in America. Wake up. Just read your Constitution and Bill of Rights. No. You can twist it and say that's the reason. Of course, you wouldn't apply that same irrational logic to any other place of your life. You know, if you had a hole in your roof and the rain was pouring in, you wouldn't say, praise God, it's in the end days and, you know, give no thought for tomorrow, blah, 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 blah. Take the word of God out of context and then your house is flooded and it begins to rot Oh, come on, you, you would be so fast on that phone making sure that roof got repaired or you do it yourself because you wouldn't want your house to rot and you wouldn't want to get soaking wet and all the other consequences from having a, a, a hole on your roof and letting the rain pour in. You'd take care of business, right? Of course you would. So why don't you apply that same biblical principle of taking care of business and why don't you get into the mode, I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to the church in general in America. Why don't you get into the mode of 
taking care of business, like such as, for example, hint, do business until I come, says Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is do kingdom business until I come. Now, what is kingdom business? And again, this is the, 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 one of the critical reasons for our ministry. Paul McGuire Ministries, Paradise Mountain Church. It's, this is the reason, the driving force, the reason why I am doing everything I can to launch a television studio with your help. It has to be done. Expand the radio. Expand the ministry. Expand the influence. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I know you do. Expand the influence because we're in the battle for the hearts and minds of mankind. And unless this teaching goes out there, and unless this communication goes out there, God's people are going to continue to perish for lack of knowledge and wisdom, and all kinds of horrible, awful things are going to happen unnecessarily because most people, with few exceptions, are not exposed to the meat of the word, just the, the milk and cookies of the word, and they're not getting the truth that will set them free. They're, give, they're getting a, a pacifier in their mouth, and they're going to perish, and it's going to be cruel, nasty, and ugly. Well, well, you know, I remember hearing all these big-time pastors years ago talk about so romantically persecution. And I noticed that they all lived in expensive upper-middle-class neighborhoods and, and nice houses, and they were far, far removed from any persecution, but they loved to talk about it on the radio and in their sermons about how it would purify the church. Oh, praise Jesus, as I sit in my oh, lovely house next to the golf course and uh, I'm totally safe, a uh, gated community, and yeah, the persecution is going to be good for the church. Again, a partial truth. God will work with anything that he has. And yes, the cruelty and horror of persecution can be used by God to shape the church and to, to uh, get the focus on Jesus and the gospel. But look, man, use your head. Interpret the word of God. Rightly divide the word. It's not romantic persecution. Persecution is a last resort by God. If he uses it, it's a last resort. It's because God used everything he possibly could to reach his people and to wake them up, but because they were stiff-necked and absolutely refused to be teachable, as a last resort, God allows persecution. It's not to be welcomed. It's not to be romanticized. Because guess what happens in persecution? And some of these guys who love to talk about how great persecution is ought to get their posteriors up off the couch and do a little studying about what persecution is really like in nations where Christians are being persecuted even more intensely than America. Read, for example, the, the book by the great uh, Christian minister, uh, Dr. Richard Wormbrand. I forgot what communist nation he endured horrible persecution under the communists. Now, I don't want to offend anybody, so please give me some grace if I offend you. In fact, if you have children in the room, for the next four minutes, I would advise, this is a warning, um, for the next four minutes, I would advise strongly that you don't play this out loud in front of children for the next four minutes. I'm going to be as del delicate as I can be. I really make every effort to be as delicate as I can be, but I'm, I have to communicate the truth. Or, or, so I'm giving you a heads up. So turn down the audio if you have young children in the room. After four minutes, you'll be safe. What? And here it goes. It begins now. You've been warned. So Dr. Ormbrand. Christian pastor and evangelist loved Jesus and the horrible persecution he suffered personally and saw with his own eyes. And I forgot what Eastern uh, former Soviet bloc uh, communist nation that used, to, uh, that used to be part of Russia he was being persecuted in. But he said, first of all, he was tortured brutally, constantly beaten, tortured with all kinds of instruments unbearable pain, inhuman torturing and suffering. They were demanding that he renounce his faith in Jesus Christ. And, and he, he was a great man of God. He didn't renounce it. But they tortured him brutally, 
I don't need to describe the brutal techniques of brutal torture. I'll just leave it to your imagination. But then he also described, and ladies, forgive me, I'm not trying to offend you, but if you don't understand what the intensity of persecution is all about, <clears throat> then we just live in la-la land. It broke my heart to hear this account from this godly Christian pastor who endure, endured the brutality of communist persecution. And he would describe how nuns, you know, they, 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 they herded them all into concentration camps and prisons. And, you know, everything happened. But he was talking about nuns being brutally raped. Young, young girls being brutally raped. And all kinds of evil, evil things. Torture, all kinds of stuff, man. And that's, that's it. That's the end of the description. So actually, it was less than four minutes. So now it's safe to turn it up again. So all kinds of things. See, that's what really happens. How can you romanticize that? Especially when God has given you the power to do something about it so it doesn't have to happen. How can you romanticize it? Romanticizing it is the same as permitting it. Remember the pilgrims and Puritans in America, Deuteronomy 28. Remember that America has been given to us as a spiritual inheritance because of the faithfulness of the pilgrims and Puritans. Remember that America, because of that spiritual inheritance, is the most unique nation on the planet Earth, despite the fact that it has all kinds of faults. It's the only nation on planet Earth, the only nation on planet Earth, which has a constitution and a bill of rights that guarantees religious freedom, religious liberty, and other freedoms associated with it. Now, it is true, those freedoms are, are severely being uh, under attack and noticed by people that have a communist ideology. Those freedoms are being attacked. They're going after them like wolves. But God gave us those freedoms. Now, process this with me. Let's think out loud together. God gave us these freedoms in America so that America could be a platform for preaching the gospel and shining the light of Jesus Christ around the world. And now, because the church has been so unfaithful to God and has abdicated its responsibility, it has failed to win enough souls to Christ, it has failed to make disciples or teach your worldview to all nations. And by the way, the teaching that I'm giving you for the last hour is what I would put in the category of making disciples of all nations because what I'm doing is I'm teaching you from the word and God's prophetic word um, a biblical worldview. In other words, I'm showing you and teaching you from the word of God uh, with historical analysis and cultural analysis and God's prophetic word. I'm showing you the results, positive and negative, of what happens when the, the truth of God's word is violated or the truth of God's word is disobeyed or the truth of God's word is wrongly divided so that spiritual error comes in. I'm explaining, communicating a biblical worldview about how this influences that for the purpose of teaching the word of God so that you can be set free you should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So that's the purpose. That's the purpose of the ministry. That's why we have to get on television. That's why we have to buy more cameras. That's why we have to have a studio that works. That's why we have to hire some people. Um, uh, we have to, because the time is short. And unless we get this teaching out, and there's not many people teaching this kind of stuff, unless we get it, unless we get it out, we are going to perish. My people perish for lack of knowledge, not only here in America, but there are people that are going to perish in all kinds of nations unless this kind of Bible teaching, making disciples of all nations, winning souls, emphasis on occupying until he comes, emphasis on doing kingdom business until he comes, and by God's grace and your prayers and your financial support and backing, we have got to take the land. It's now or never. And I don't want to get into the whole thing, but if you look at this fake news garbage, it's all it is, is a, it, it, it's, it's censorship. It's dictatorial censorship. 
where where they they really want to do this and they're and they're trying to they're chomping at the bit. They want to censor the internet. They want to censor the social media we're using, the television we're we're trying to use, and the radio and everything else. So that anything, like what I've discussed since the beginning of this program, the Paul McGuire Report, they want to censor all of that because they don't want people to know the truth. You understand? And most, they already got most Christian churches, 74% at least. Uh, They conquered them from within. They're no threat to the devil. Is that a, you know why they're no threat to the devil? Because if you're not preaching the truth, the devil will leave you alone. You're really by not te- let's not kid ourselves. If you're not teaching the truth, guess what? You're already crossed over to the devil's side. I don't care how many crosses you have on the, on the top of your building. If you're not preaching the truth, you already joined the devil's side. The only people who get persecuted are those people who are on Jesus' side because the devil hates Jesus and his message. So look, I desperately need your help. I need you to pray to God and ask God to reveal to you supernaturally. I can't do it by hyping you up or anything else. I need you to pray to God and ask God to reveal to you supernaturally what your personal responsibility is in helping us launch the television ministry and outreach because people are visual. I like words and books, but people are visual. We've got to broadcast on social media Christian networks, and use every avenue of communication we can, which is books, DVDs, television, 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 radio, television, television, television. Because that stuff's out there, but how much of it is really communicating uh, the truth and the power of God's Word, which we're sharing with you today? That's how we make a difference. That's the only way you can effectively occupy the land until Jesus comes. That's the only way you can really win souls for Jesus Christ. It's the only way that you can make disciples or communicate a biblical worldview to all nations. It's the only way you can recapture these lost generations of young people like the millennials who have been indoctrinated to not believe in the gospel. We are fighting a spiritual war. Come on, you know that. We're fighting an all-out spiritual war. And there are real demons. There are real fallen angels. There is a real spirit of Antichrist. But there's also the power of the Holy Spirit. There's also the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. There's also the angelic armies of God. There's also the guardian angels. There's also the power of the Holy Spirit infusing God's faithful people with power from on high. And so that we should be taking the land, not being conquered. And this fits into Bible prophecy and eschatology. You can help us by going to paulmcguire.us, paulmcguire.us. None of this money goes to me. It goes to the ministry. Because time is short. Now, why communicating the power of truth is so essential is that if you rightly divide the Word of God, you understand that, indeed, one of the signs of the times of the last days is persecution. Jesus Christ warned repeatedly in the New Testament that all true Christians will suffer tribulation and have to endure persecution. We are warned about it over and over again. And as the world becomes spiritually darker, which it is, the spiritual persecution will intensify. So there I would agree with all Christians who say that in the last days, Jesus said, the Bible says there will be an increase of persecution. That's absolutely correct. I don't disagree with you for a second. But it has to be rightly divided. You have to take that truth and uh, also open up numerous other passages of, of Scripture to understand that truth in its proper context by connecting it to countless Bible verses in the Word of God, which give you an expanded and clear uh, expanded de- definition and clear understanding of the fact, and it is a fact biblically, that in the last days there will be an increase of persecution. And that is, America was given by God. You see, we, you and I were not raised in a communist dictatorship. We were raised in America where the, where the benefits of the pilgrims and Puritans who were strong Christians. And they created legal documents which guarantee us the freedom to practice the Christian religion. 
freedom of religion, freedom of press, uh, freedom of uh, <clears throat> uh, speech, the right to assemble peacefully, um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and other guaranteed freedoms. That means we're guaranteed by the ultimate law of the land in America the right to do what I'm doing, for example, which is using every means of communication I can to uh, communicate Christianity, communicate the Bible, communicate the message of salvation. But that's under attack. And that in itself is persecution. So I agree with my brothers and sisters there. The only place that I would differ is that we have to take the reality that, yes, God says in the last days there will be an increase in persecution. That's absolutely true. But also, God constantly teaches about the law of sowing and reaping. The, 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 the fact that God will supernaturally intervene if God's people repent and cry out to him. And countless other scriptures. Now, that doesn't mean we can ever come to the place that our prayers uh, to God can ever uh, change one iota of God's prophetic word. What God has written down specifically and prophetically will come to pass. No fasting, praying, repentance will in any way, shape, or form <clears throat> alter God's prophetic word because that's his sovereign plan. <clears throat> but where God is not specific, we have the biblical right to compare it with other scriptures that are applicable. So when Jesus Christ said uh, that there would be uh, persecution and martyrdom and tribulation in the last days. All that is true. But as you examine it more closely, it's not that like every second, every single uh, Christian on planet Earth is going to be under persecution or martyrdom every second of every day. Persecution will intensify or be lessened in different geographic era, uh, areas, and there's all kinds of uh, other factors involved in that. So, Jesus said, occupy until I come and make disciples of all nations, including America, which means communicate to them a biblical worldview. And then Jesus said, occupy the land until I come. What land? Well, for us, it's America. It's the land God gave us. If you're in Venezuela, it's, it's that land. If you're in Great Britain, it's that land. If you're in New Zealand, it's that land. If you're in Australia, it's that land. If you're in South America, it's that land. You understand? You're to occupy the land that God has given you. But God has given Americans, simply by sovereign election, not because we're worthy of it, a unique responsibility and privilege given to us by the pilgrims and Puritans. So part of the occupation of the land is the Church of Jesus Christ is, the, is supposed to preach the gospel. That changes cultures and nations. The more you win people to Jesus, the more righteous and happy a nation becomes. When you don't uh, win enough people to Jesus Christ, the, 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 the spiritual atmosphere of the nation grows darker and more, and, and more ugly. Persecution increases. <clears throat> but here is where the church, the Bible is not fatalism. You've got to grasp that concept. Now, the Bible is fatalism when it comes to God specifically speaking through his sovereign prophetic words specifically about specific things. But not where God says something generally. You can't bend that and make it specific when it's general. In the same way, it has to be right. That's what we mean by rightly divide, dividing the word of God, getting it right. So, 50, 60 years ago, there was no Christian persecution in America for the most part. Okay? 50, 60 years ago, immorality was at a far lower level and largely hidden in America. 50, 60 years ago, the prosperity level of the working class and middle class was considerably higher than it is today. In fact, women didn't even have to work. You know, they have brainwashed women and men to believe that, oh, great, it's a great freedom that women can work. Well, I think women should have absolutely the right to work. But in most cases, women are forced to work because they've created an economy, economy which demands that the husband and wife work to earn the same amount of money that the man could have earned alone. 
And now the latest statistics say that there's a huge percentage of women that would prefer not to work. They'd rather be with their children. So, yeah, that was a great prize. I support the woman's right to work. Absolutely, 100%. If a woman wants to work, she should be able to have that right. Obviously, especially a single woman and married woman. If they want to do that, that's perfectly fine with me. But that was not given to you as some great liberation thing. It was given to you, if you had the mind of Christ, you would see it clearly, as a method of enslavement. Because they want to... They don't want you to raise your children. They don't want the mommy and daddy to raise the children. It takes, quote, a village to raise the child. They want, they want to raise your children apart from you. So if the mother's forced to work and the father's forced to work, then they go to public daycare centers, etc., where they are indoctrinated with the beliefs and the values of not the Christian parents, but the secular state. Uh-oh. Wake up. Snooze button is off, baby. Now, here's the other thing. If, so 50, 60 years ago, America was a different place. Yes, we understand that there was a need for civil rights. That we understand that African Americans were not treated properly. America is far from perfect. And we understand the sins of America. And we also understand the need for social justice. But really, let's not kid ourselves. Let's not play mental games. The plight of the African American in America 50, 60 years ago, the average African American in America lived far better and a far more prosperous life than most people in the entire world. Okay? So it's a matter of perspective. No, they didn't have the same advantages as the white middle class. That's true. And there was prejudice. That's true. And that needed to be rectified. That's true. And it still needs to be rectified. And that's true. But we understand that. That's part of the equation. But here's the thing. <clears throat> 50 or 60 years ago, we were still basically a Christian culture, a Christian nation where Christian and Judeo-Christian values and morality and beliefs uh, essentially directed and controlled our society, at least publicly. Not perfectly. There was hypocrisy. Uh, there was prejudice. But essentially, with, with, with uh, far from being perfect, but it was essentially a Christian consensus, a Christian belief system uh, and behavior system was essentially um, guiding America, the, which means, in practical terms, America and the church to whatever degree, uh, first the church was reading the Word of God properly, teaching the Word of God, and living the Word of God properly. If you look at the sermons in the average Christian church just 30 years ago, they are night and day from what they are today. When I, got for, when I first got saved, this was 40 years ago, any place I went to church, Baptist church, Nazarene church, uh, all kinds of churches, the word of God was front and center, and they preached the entire Bible. And I could go to any church, messages of salvation, messages of repentance, forgiveness of sins, and all kinds of solid biblical teaching. Now, 40 years later, you need a microscope to find churches that preach the word like they used to preach it in the average church. So because the people of God in America, the Christians, began to reject God's word, <clears throat> reject God's laws, and to reject God himself, a curse came upon America. Deuteronomy 28, we began to worship false gods, idols, and we began to not to diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. In other words, we began to disobey God's word and principles 50 or 60 years ago. And according to Deuteronomy 28, the blessing then begins to be removed and the curse then comes on the nation. And so in the same time period, 50, 60 years ago, we made a major shift that has increased in intensity of rejecting God and, and, and giving ourselves over to materialism, humanism, 
uh, pleasure seeking materialism, self, self, self. And as a result, guess what? Middle class wages crashed. Working class wages crashed. Freedoms taken away. Now we're in a surveillance state. Uh, <clears throat> Christianity, missionaries, uh, evangelism, uh, churches, uh, salvations, all have gone down, way down, way down. Every Christian influence, every, every measurement of true Christian biblical spirituality is on the decline because we turned away from God in a big way about 50 or 60 years ago. <clears throat> so to the degree that we turn back to God, God will restore as long as that window of time prophetically is open. Now, what that means is that persecution against Christians didn't come just because it was the last days. Christian persecution came as a direct result of God's laws of sowing and reaping. Christian persecution and all the immorality, etc., was a direct result of God's people rejecting God's word and rejecting God. And the consequences of rejecting the truth <clears throat> funneled through the church to all of society, and now it is boomeranged, and the church is, is largely powerless, and the church is under persecution, and it's being attacked, and it's increasing and increasing. But the reason isn't, isn't just because we're in the last days. The reason is because God's people in America disobeyed the word of God. They failed to occupy the land. Otherwise, they would have fought in the courts, in the Supreme Court. They would have fought militantly for their religious liberties. But instead, they laid down and surrendered. The Christian church in America basically surrendered on every key spiritual battle. Or, if they didn't surrender, they got into the game so late with such a small minority of true Christians standing up for their beliefs that they lost one spiritual battle after another. So our whole nation was torn apart spiritually because God people, God's people deserted the spiritual battlefield. They, they disobeyed God. They did not occupy the land. They disobeyed God. They did not make disciples or communicate a biblical worldview, which is what we're doing on this entire programming, to young people into the culture. They, they backed down on uh, aggressive soul winning and evangelism. We see the results of that. And <clears throat> they didn't uh, do business until Jesus Christ comes. What's that? The Christian church and individual Christians stopped doing kingdom business, which means they stopped prioritizing what God prioritized, which is winning souls, that's kingdom business, making disciples of all nations, communicating the truths and their relevance to everyday life. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we want to do on television. Um, and occupying until I come and explaining what that means. Not just occupy until I come. Explain it in nitty-gritty detail. Now, that's why we're suffering persecution. You can't just say it's the last days. That's not rightly dividing the word of God. And what that really is, that's exactly what, that is the same sin that Adam com committed when God asked him why he was, why he knew he was naked, why he was afraid, and why he was ashamed. Adam, who had disobeyed God, blamed it entirely on Eve, his wife. He passed the buck. He blamed it on the woman. Instead of saying the true truth, see, he lied with the partial truth. See, you lie with partial truths, and you misinterpret the word of God with partial truths, or you take truths out of context. And that's exactly what Adam did. God said he knew that they ate of the tree. God knew they that they disobeyed his primary command to them. And so he looked at Adam because Adam was taught by God at the beginning that he was the spiritual head, that he was the head of the wife in, in the marriage relationship and the head under God in terms of primary authority on planet Earth. Therefore, no matter what happened, it happened under his watch and his command, and he ultimately was responsible. So when God said, you know, basically, what happened, Adam? Because Adam knew that he was naked, he was ashamed, 
they put fig leaves on, on themselves. And Adam gave this weaselly excuse. Uh, well, the woman ate and you know, basically tried to blame it on Eve. No, that's a lie because it's based on partial truth. What he should have said to God was, God, I am responsible for sinning and allowing my wife Eve to sin against your word. Because, Lord, I admit to you, you gave me the spiritual authority to be head over this relationship and everything that happens under this relationship. And you gave me the spiritual authority to be head and the leader above everything and every person except for you, because you are the true God. And therefore, I accept responsibility, and we ate of the tree in the middle of the garden, instead of blaming it on Eve, because ultimately it happened under his watch, so he's responsible. Yeah, he's responsible too, but he's more responsible, because he's the top dog under God. So we don't do that with the Word of God. We don't say, oh, you know, we don't interpret the Word and spin it. And that's why, in terms of Bible prophecy, we have to rightly divide the prophetic Word of God. We have to understand that there's a reason why you and I are alive at this time, in this prophetic time. There's a reason that you and I have been chosen before the beginning of time to be here at such a time as this, which is the last days, we're here in this prophecy zone by God's design. Therefore, God has a special plan and purpose for us to fulfill in this prophetic season called the last days. Before a full outbreak, if you will, of the tribulation period, where the mark of the beast is going to be distributed and the Antichrist is going to take power over the new world order, and, and the New World Order, which is the same thing as Mystery Babylon, is a Luciferian system, and they're going to bring in. Nobody will be able to stop it then, because at God, when God, God has announced it in his prophetic word, there are things we can do to resist it and slow it down now. And we should do everything we can to put the brakes on it, by the way. That's why we're here. That's why the church is still here. The church would not be here if it didn't have a job to do. Look, wake up. God would take the church out if our job was finished. The reason the church is here is that God is obviously demonstrating that his purpose for the church is not over. I don't care when your, your belief is in terms of the tribulation period. It's blatantly obvious that God is not finished with the church because the evidence of that is that we're here. We are the church. And, as such, we have instructions and commandments from Jesus Christ, who's the head of the church, on exactly what we're supposed to do and why we're here. So nobody should be walking around clueless saying, God, why am I here? You need to get slapped in the face. You are here, and Jesus explained why. You're here for many reasons, and you can find them out by reading God's Word on a regular basis. But we're also here... The Great Commission is to win souls for Jesus Christ, to make disciples and communicate a biblical worldview to all nations, to occupy the land until he comes, and to do business until he comes, kingdom business. Those are our primary responsibilities. And then we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, and love our wives and husbands, love our children, and be faithful in whatever a natural position God has given us and use our natural gifts and abilities and talents and so on and so forth. But that's our primary mission. And that's why the church is here. Because God, we're still in the hour where God is pouring out his grace, unmerited favor, through the church in what is described as a last day's soul harvest. There's still the possibility to put the brakes on or if God will grant it, uh, give us a reprieve, our temporal time zone, a, rest a temporal restoration of freedoms and blessing. There's no way. Look, look, you know, don't just run off the edge of the cliff with, with, with wrongly dividing the Word of God. There's no place in the Bible that says America's over at this particular point and America's doomed and it can't have an economic recovery or anything like that or a revival. Just, where do you see that in the Bible? It, it's non existent. It's non existent unless you impose it upon the Scripture by interpretation. 
The fact of the matter is, in the time zone we're in, we're here for a purpose. God is sovereign. It will play out as he wants it to play out. But in the meantime, we're to do, we're to be busy doing what he told us to do. We're to be faithful. It's like we're, we're a spiritual, law-abiding, peaceful army. We're occupying the land. We should be faithful in occupying the land, winning souls to Jesus Christ, communicating a, a biblical worldview, and doing business until he comes. That takes care of a whole lot of things. And then, repenting, asking for God's help, and standing in prayer, spiritual warfare for our nation, praying for our leaders, not just going back to sleep, because God uh, moved in a particular way, now we can fall asleep again. No, we're to be about our Father's business, kingdom business. And as such, we have the right and the opportunity, biblically, to ask God for all kinds of things. But don't worry about, well, is it the will of God or not the will of God? If it doesn't disagree with the Bible, then you have the right to ask. It's like healing. You always ask to be healed, and you always pray for people to be healed. But ultimately, God makes the decision. Some people are healed miraculously. Some people are healed through doctors. Some people go home to be with the Lord, which is the ultimate source of healing. God is sovereign. He makes the decision, but we're to pray. We're to pray. We don't, we don't pray, God, kill him now. We don't have the right to do that, but that's what Christians are doing all over America who claim to believe the Bible. Lord, kill America. Destroy it. Destroy us through persecution. Burn us down right now. We deserve it, God. You, shut up. You are not the judge. I'm not the judge. God makes that decision. Your responsibility is to do what the Bible tells you to do and not to and stop playing God. God is the judge, not me, not you. God says, ask. You have not because you ask not. We're told, told to pray for all those in authority. We have to obey, obey the Great Commission. We repent before the Lord. We cry out to the Lord. We obey his Great Commission. We ask God to supernaturally intervene. We ask God for economic restoration, moral restoration, etc. We ask God for those things. If God says no, that's fine. And we praise him and continue on being faithful. But God may say yes. I mean, even Abraham didn't know. And he was one of the greatest men of God that ever lived. But he entered into an, what I call an intercessory prayer dialogue concerning whether or not God was going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And God has that account where they go back and forth. God, will you judge uh, Sodom if you find 50 righteous and so on and so forth until finally it comes down to a very small number. And despite Abraham's pleading and intercession, God decides that he has to judge Sodom and Gomorrah anyway. But in an act of mercy, he allows Lot and his family uh, to, to escape the judgment of Sodom, except for Lot's wife who turned and disobeyed God and turned back and looked at Sodom. and She just turned into a pillar of salt. But there are other examples in the Bible where intercessory prayer, God reversed the curse, so to speak. He allowed restoration and healing to occur. Nineveh is one example. But there are numerous other examples in the Bible where a nation was destined for judgment and destruction by God. Okay? Nineveh. You read the accounts in 1 Kings and 2 Kings uh, of all the various kings that were raised up to rule Israel or Judah. And they, uh, these kings were either evil, and because of their evilness and rejection of the word of God, you can see immediately the curse, curses being poured out on the land in judgment. Okay? But then when a righteous king would arise, and there were quite a few righteous kings, as well as quite a few wicked kings, when the righteous kings began to cry out to the true God in prayer, when they began to repent to the true God uh, for, for their sins, when they began to call out uh, to the true God, when they began to, to uh, uh, discover and read and obey the word of God before the people, and they began to get themselves and the people in sync with God's word, guess what? God then reversed the curse, even if the previous king was wicked. He reversed the curse, and he miraculously released 
restoration, economic blessing, military victory, prosperity, etc., etc. Now let's take a look, let's take a, a a lesson from what the Word of God is actually saying, instead of wrongly dividing the Word of God. When you read the account of First Kings and Second Kings, and First Samuel and Second Samuel, you will see that there's a whole number of kings listed, quite a few, all with different names. And you will read as you go through the chapters, you know, the account of Josiah and all the others, you will notice that these kings were either wicked and did evil in the sight of the Lord, or maybe they were evil but they did a little good, or they were righteous before God and they cried out to God and they, they, they wanted to obey the word. Now, as long as that king lived, he ruled. And so you'll see, as you go through every different king with every different name, that the entire atmosphere of Israel and Judah changed based on whether that king was leading the people in a righteous or sinful and wicked manner. If the king was evil and, and uh, encouraging wickedness and breaking God's law and, and worshiping idols, judgment, the hammer came down. But when that king died and the next king was appointed, no matter how much devastated uh, the land was, if the following king, who would be appointed immediately after the other king died, if he was righteous and sought after God, cried out to the true God, uh, wanted to do the will of God according to God's word, then God would instantaneously begin restoration, prosperity, healing, and blessing upon that nation. And so you see, king after king, it's like it's looking at a graph, up, down, up, down, up, down, immediately. So you can have all kinds of evil going in the United States, and then all of a sudden, and we may be at one of these all of a sudden moments, at least there's the possibility that, there's the possibility that, whoa, righteousness may again manifest. If God's people stop playing church and really turn to him and, and hit a spiritual home run in their prayers and worship to the true God, then God can pour out restoration, prosperity, blessing, military victory, peace, salvation, and righteousness, even though down the line sometime in the future, the tribulation and judgment is going to happen, and the new world order, the one world government, the one world religion, and the one world economic system. So, you know, to, to explain this, I talk about this in my all of my prophecy books. A Prophecy of the Future of America, the first one, uh, The Day the Dollar Died, Standing Down Goliath, uh, Mass Awakening, um, A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017, the four DVD set, A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017, and the brand new DVD uh, produced after the election, America, What's Going to Happen Next, a three DVD set. And we have bundle prices and discounts, and you can get all that, plus tons of free articles. You can listen to all the archives of the Paul McGuire Report free. Uh, plenty of YouTubes uh, by going to paulmcguire.us, paulmcguire.us. But you can tell, I hope, I pray, that I have a tremendous sense of urgency. Because, you see, the scales kind of represent God's judgment. And he's weighing all the facts regarding America right now. I believe that. And he will make his decision based on righteousness. So if wickedness is, is the predominant force in America, then the scales are going to be tilted, and it's a no-brainer. God's edict will be judgment. But if the scales of righteousness, uh, the righteousness begins to increase, the amount of righteousness begins to increase, and God's people begin to repent and become righteous again, and obey God and his mandate for the church, then righteousness could increase if God's people will pray and obey the Great Commission, and God may grant a, a, a uh, temporal restoration. By temporal, I don't know how long. I'm not God. Five years, 10 years, 25 years, I have no idea. 50 years, 100 years, I have no idea. Neither do you. We can speculate. Doesn't mean we know for sure. And then... Uh, this reprieve, God may grant however long he wishes. Now, at a certain point in time, 
there's going to be a transition when the responsibility will no longer be upon the church. The church will have fulfilled its mission. And at that time, this new world order, which they're trying to shut, you know why the new world order hasn't happened yet? Because God is restraining it from happening. Did you hear me? The only reason the new world order has not exploded into violent life, and the only reason that the one world government, one world economic system, and one world religion is not fully in place is because God is restraining it. I mean, these, these, these elites, they already have the microchip technology. They're drooling to force us to get it. God is restraining that from happening. All these evil Luciferian elites and their wicked plans for a new world order, which is nothing more than mystery Babylon, and their evil plans for a one world godless government and a one world godless religion and a one world uh, godless economic system with a false prophet and an antichrist, that's all being restrained right now. Do you understand that? The power of Almighty God is holding them in check because God has not determined that this is the time. And it's only for that reason that we have the open doors to preach the gospel. It's God's grace upon us. Recognize that. So we pray. We cry out to God. We take care of kingdom business. And then God, he's king of kings, not me, not you. And he will decide when our mission is over. And he will decide when, boom, all of a sudden, restraint, restrainer, is removed. And this new world order, this beast system, there's a reason why God calls it a beast system. The fourth beast. It's hideous, it's ugly, it's demonic, it's satanic. That's why it's called the fourth beast. And it will rise in its time temporarily. But as it begins to rise, God is going to pour out the tribulation judgments upon the new world order, one world government, one world economic system, one world religion, and mystery Babylon. God is going to pour out his judgment during the seven-year tribulation period. That will hyper-escalate into what is called the wrath of God will be poured out upon the earth because the Antichrist sets himself up in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem demanding to be worshipped as God. You got to understand all this, and you got to help us get this message out. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And as the Lord leads you, share this program far and wide. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. PaulMcGuire.us. Five percent missing the big picture. You give God everything. You sell yourself out totally to God's kingdom principles, and God will bless you via Deuteronomy 28, and you will see supernatural favor guidance, prosperity, provision, answers to prayer, salvation, healing, and all kinds of things. I mean, that works if you do it biblically. So I want to encourage you to do this biblically. And, and remember that God has given you this opportunity to do it. Eventually, all of Bible prophecy will be fulfilled, and this, this opportunity will be non-existent. God bless you. Please pass uh, this program along to those who need it by visiting paulmcguire.us. Thank you for listening. I'm Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report and visit paulmcguire.us. Mm -hmm.